We're going to talk about Akiata in just a moment, but it's your first time at the festival. So let's just go backwards a bit. Tell us about, you said you grew up in New York. Um, so tell us where you live now and tell us about uh, how you ended up there. Um, I live um, partially in the town that you guys saw on the screen, which is also the place where we shot these last three films. It's called Gioia Tauro, and it's in the very, very south of Italy. Uh -huh. um, I moved there about 10 years ago, uh -huh. trying just trying to do research for a short film. Mm -hmm. um, and then one thing led to another, and I still live there 10 years later. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, basically, you know, it's, um, I live between there and Palermo. Like I said before, I grew up here in New York. Um, you know, uh, uh, technically... You could say Italian American in the sense that, like, I am both Italian and American. Although, you know, the, the actual story is a little more complicated than the normal image people associate with Italian Americans. In the sense that, you know, I'm the only Carpignano who's ever been born in New York. Um, don't have a big Italian family here. My whole family here is sort of African American. So these two things together sort of complicate the general notion people have of Italian American families. Like, no cousin Joey or Uncle Tony. Um, <laughs> Um, so, you know, I, I you know, also grew up on the Italian side in a filmmaking family. My grandfather used to make these commercials known as Caroselli. So while I wasn't a kid, you know, trying to make films when I was really, really young, I grew up very close to cinema. So when it became time for me to go off and start doing my own things, it felt very natural to move back to Italy because, you know, the, 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 the cinema world felt very close to me. Mm -hmm. So you talk about these three films. Um, there's uh, Mediterranea and Aciambra. Um, that preceded this. Check them out. Look them up if you haven't seen them. Um, but you said that it was a short film that took you back to where your family is from, where your family is. Um, tell us about that decision. Did you did you did you imagine that you would pick up and end up living there ten years later, or, or what was the plan at that point? That was definitely not the plan. <laughs> um, I you know as I mentioned before, my I was I've always been very interested in sort of like race relations in Italy for reasons you can imagine, given my background. And in 2010, there was this really big race riot in Southern Italy where sort of the African immigrants who had come over for the first time staged a revolt to sort of gain, make the country more aware of the conditions they were living in. So I'd gone down in 2010 initially to do research on that phenomenon, what had happened there. Um, almost immediately decided after that that I wanted to make a feature film in the same space, like, you know, touching the same reality. And I was lucky enough to meet the character who you guys meet in this film very briefly, but it has a much larger role in the other two films. Um, the actor's name is Kudu Sehun, um, and the film's name is Aiva, and he and I moved in together almost immediately in southern Italy to try and make the feature film. You know, for better or for worse, it took much longer to make the feature film than we had planned. Like, we got down there in 2011. We didn't end up making the film in 2015, and over the course of those five years is when the move sort of happened. You know, I, like, sort of slowly move more and more stuff down there. All of a sudden, I had, my doctor was down there. All of a sudden, I was paying taxes down there. All of a sudden, I was voting down there. <laughs> and I woke up one day and just like lived in Joya Tauro. <laughs> so um, you, you mentioned that um, you have family who come from film. Um, tell, tell us about how you made the decision to pursue that for yourself. Um... Starting off with the easy questions, like the who are you kind of questions. Yeah. <laughs> the next one will be about the film. All right. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, like I said, I, I grew up close to cinema. You know what I mean? So I've always, always sort of been a part of me as long as I can remember. You know, when I was young at the dinner table in Italy, mm -hmm. people were always arguing about film, talking about film. My grand uncle was also a filmmaker. His name is Luciano Amer. His most famous film is... Um, Domenica de Gosto, which is the first film that Marcello Mastoriani was ever in. And that's his claim to fame, and he would tell us every single dinner. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, in the beginning, I didn't want to have anything to do with cinema. For me, it was sort of like the homework thing that the old people were talking about at the dinner table when I just wanted to open presents on Christmas, yeah. you know. But at the same time, once I went to university, was in university, started studying cinema, and I decided that I sort of wanted to be a filmmaker, or I thought that I would roll the dice and see if it would work out. It just made sense for me to do it in a place where I felt close to cinema, where I felt like I knew the traditions and I felt in one way or another part of that tradition because, you know, my grandfather was making films and my granduncle was making films and, you know, it just felt like my family life in Italy was very tied to cinema. Yeah. So tell us about the seeds of this film. Tell us about where the, where the 
original ideas came from and um, did you find the ideas for this film or did the ideas for this film come to you in a similar way to um, the way you conceived of, of your other two features? This one, this, this one was very different in the sense that, as I mentioned before, I went to Calabria to make that first film, Mediterranean. Like that was my goal for being there. And short, and then it became the short, and then became a feature. And like that was my goal to go down there to make it. And then, as I said before, I didn't plan on living there, but I ended up living there. And as a result of that, I got to know people in the town a lot. And I remember that as I was traveling with Mediterranean, you know, because if you were to Google Joya Tauro, one of the first things that comes up is the port. Indrangheta, Mafia, that's what it's mainly known for. So often as I was traveling with Mediterranean, people would often tell me that I should make a film like that. But not only would they tell me that I should make a film about that world, they would often tell me how to do it, you know, sort of like their idea of what it was. And I noticed that like their vision of what life was like there had nothing to do with the way we were actually living there, you know. So I thought to myself, if ever one day I'm going to make a film ambient uh, in this world, it takes place in this world, I'm going to do it closer to the reality that I've seen, you know, and luckily, I mean, not luckily, but living in that town, you know, I've, I've never seen shootouts. There's never been a shootout in the 10 years that I've lived there, but every single mafia film you see starts or has a shootout somewhere in the middle, right? I've never seen that. So I never want to make a film that had that point of view. What I have seen, you know, I've seen, I've seen cars burned. I've seen people become fugitives. Uh, and what touched me once was when I saw the father of this young girl that I knew, she was like seven or eight years old, become a fugitive. I remember seeing the effect that it had on her. And I thought to myself, okay, that's sort of where I would put my hands if I were to try and tell this story. Like, this is something that's very real to the people who live in this town. And I think if we were to make a film that looked at it from this point of view, the people of the town would feel closer to it as opposed to these films where we see people with Sicilian accents who are somehow in Calabria shooting machine guns all over the place. You know, like that's, that has nothing to do with what life is like there. And again, I don't want to ignore the fact that, you know, this, 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 the, the crime family is like are part of the social fabric of the town, but not in the way that most people think. So the idea was sort of to not correct that vision, but just show it from a point of view that was closer to what we'd been living or what we have lived these past 10 years. So in addition to the place, um, in what ways do you see either, in other way, uh, what ways did you see either intentionally that there would be a, a through line, a connection, um, a relationship between each of these three films or in what, in what ways, in what ways do you not see that? Yeah, I mean, obviously it would be much better to sit here and say I had a plan from the beginning and it was all written. It would definitely make me look more competent and better, um, but that's definitely not the case. I mean, it, it's something that sort of grew as each film. It, the, as my knowledge of the place and my relationship with the people grew, the films grew as well. And, you know, it was impossible for me to get to know these worlds without seeing how they related to the other worlds I'd initially been in. So it was it felt natural to connect them because I lived them in that connected way, you know? And for me, the idea was always to give sort of a mosaic picture of what life is like in Joya Tauro through the three films, but through the eyes of three very specific people as opposed to making films that concentrate a lot on the context of what's going on, you know? Like I never, I never got to know that town by reading tons of books on it or like reading newspaper articles about it. I learned about these various worlds through people. Mm -hmm. So for me, the idea was always to keep these people in these three films and hope that the audience has this attachment to these people as well to get to know these worlds through their eyes and not the way that you know we see them in headlines and newspapers. Uh, I met you uh, when I saw your first film and I observe uh, a maturing in your filmmaking process and in your work over these three films. How do you see that? How do you see your growth as a filmmaker as you think about the work you've done now with these three features? Do you sense that evolution, growth? Uh, I hope so, and that's nice to hear you say it. Um, <laughs> you know, obviously, um, every single time we go out to make a film, we're that much, we're a little bit richer because of what we did before. And you know, I have the great advantage of having an incredible group of people that I work with. A lot of them are here tonight. And many of them, most of them have been the same since the very first film. So we've all sort of grown together and we sort of have a shorthand that allows us to not waste time with the things that we maybe wasted time with in the beginning. You know, and that goes through every single facet. You know, like a, a small example is like sort of my cinematographer, I think, is hiding here somewhere behind a mask and a hat. But, you know, he and I at this point, we don't 
even need to say certain things to each other. Like we can sort of just like look at each other or touch each other and we know immediately what we're going to do. And I think that that allows us to spend more time concentrating on, you know, growing and getting better and trying new things as opposed to figuring each other out. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the, in terms of the film, in terms of the, the young woman at the center of it, how did you find your Kiata in this case? Um, like both luck and like the benefits of like living in the place you work, you know? So we were doing auditions for a chambra and we were looking for, we we're doing a school scene where Pio was going to go to school. We ended up not including that scene in the film, but we had a small audition. And I remember that her aunt, the one that she's in the car with, who's actually her aunt and her cousin, who's the one who sort of drives her around at the end, they brought her to an audition and she was nine years old at the time. Three days before, I just submitted the first treatment for a Chiara. So we were about to shoot a Chambra, but I already had it in the back of my head, the idea that this was going to be the next film. And she showed up at this audition and she just like struck me. It was like, like, like love at first sight kind of thing. Like I saw her and she was amazing. And unfortunately, I didn't have a role for her then, but I kept in my mind like she's going to be Chiara. Obviously, I didn't tell her that because she was nine at the time and I didn't want to disappoint her if things were not going to go well. But in my head, I was like, okay, we found her, you know? So I put that to the back of my head. We made a chambra. And over the course of the years after that, I sort of kept tabs on her. You know, I kept my eye on her. Yeah. Um, you know, I became, I'm still close with her friends. Oh, I'm sorry, with her cousin, her parents, her aunt, her uncle. And because of that, I was able to observe her over the years. And that was sort of like the greatest advantage to this film because I was able to write her into Chiara. You know what I mean? The more the time went on, the more elements of Swami Rotolo, who's the actress, ended up taking over Kiara's character. So there's a lot of her and her family in this in this film, even though they're doing things that haven't actually happened to them. And at what point, uh, tell me about the point when you clued her into the fact that you've been rewriting a script with her at the center of it, and now you want her to be at the center of it. Yeah, she, she was hesitant. <laughs> <laughs> she was hesitant at first because, you know, I, I'm... She's, a f when I approached her, or when she first started to realize that maybe I had something in my head, she was a 15-year-old girl just trying to hang out with her friends near the beach in the summer, and I was always around like, hey, what's up? You know, and she was kind of like, what does this guy want from me, you know? <laughs> like, I'm old enough to be her father, you know, and she's just trying to hang out with her friends and smoke cigarettes on the sly, you know what I mean? And here I am constantly trying to, you know, get to the point where I can actually tell her that we want to do this. Um, and then finally we were able to tell her, I was like, let's shoot a short film first. That was the first thing. We always try to shoot a short film to sort of try out the actors, test the cinematic grammar, see how we're going to see what we're going to do really. And so when we told her that we want to make a short film, her first response was, I can't do that right now because, um, because she had a bunch of parties she needed to go to or something like that. Um, and then when I explained to her it was going to be very, very short and she might be able to miss some school to do it, she was in. <laughs> She said, right away. So we shot that short film a few months before we shot the feature film. At that point, she still had no idea that I'd written a whole feature for her. We shot the short film. She saw it once it was cut together. And they sort of gave her a little bit of confidence to say, like, oh, well, maybe I can do this. So almost immediately after, I told her there was a feature film that we wanted to make. Again, she was hesitant, but eventually she came around and we were able to, to, get, her, to get her in the film. We have less than five minutes, but I want to get at least one or maybe two if we're quick questions in. So right there, yes. Talk about the process of incorporating her family, a lot of non-actors. How did that work out? How did that happen? Yeah, they're, they're, I mean, they're mostly non, entirely non-actors, except for the people who were in other films who I guess by now are actors since they've been doing this for 10 years. But I mean, the, the idea was to surround her with her own family so she would always feel more comfortable on set. Like basically, um, the way we work is we sort of try and break down sort of like the classic cinematic filmmaking structure. We try and make it feel like we're just a bunch of people going out and doing something together to take away the ansia, the, 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 the anxiety that she might have. You know, there's never a moment where she's like, here I am in front of this, director here i am in front of these other actors like she's with her friend she's with her family like in that first scene that's her entire family in that bar you know and as far as they're concerned they were there celebrating a party and we were just there documenting it you know it was their party and we invited ourselves you know even though that's not the case we obviously threw the party so that we could shoot it but that the idea was to 
keep her with people that she always felt comfortable about. I should also say that, you know, over the course of the years, I didn't just get to know her. I also got to know her family well. And there were many times when over the course of those years, I would write things that I'd seen her do with her sister, for example, that I would put in the script. So like that fight that they have, obviously they've never fought about their father being in the mafia, but they fought and they fight a lot. And when they do fight, it looks a lot like that, you know? So <laughs> I remember one time they had this epic blow up in front of each other and, you know, I was kind of smiling to myself and like, what are you smiling about? And they didn't know that I was like writing the scene in my head, you know? <laughs> so it, it helps me like when, when they're all acting together, it helps me sort of like get to a place where I'm never really asking them to do something that I haven't already done in the past. You know, like the context might change a little bit, but the, 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 reporto, the, um, the relationship, the connection is very, very real. So it's like these real connections inside of this fictional structure. And I think that that is what allows them to feel comfortable and it gives them the confidence to act, you know, the way they do. Okay, we'll do one more and then we have to wrap it up. Hi. Yes. Mixing documentary style with delusion dream. Yeah, you know, when we, when we write, when I write those scenes that sort of have a more um, sort of like a lyrical feel, a more surreal feel, it's sort of to bring the audience closer to her inner psychology. You know, like we take a very observational approach normally with the quote unquote documentary style so that, you know, the viewer is invited to both participate and observe the action, just sort of see, hopefully get lost in the way this family really lives. But there comes a point where I sort of, without diving into too much unnatural dialogue or exposition, also want the audience to feel aligned with her emotional state. So we tend to add these sort of lyrical sequences or these dream sequences, hopefully to give some more insight as to how she feels based on what we've seen her react to and who we've seen her react with earlier in the film. So you talked about when you were making Achiambra, you were already thinking about Akiara. Is that the case now? When you were making Akiara, were you already thinking about the next film? Kind of, to an extent, but then life happened in the middle. Um, I'm about to have a baby and that's all I'm thinking about right now. <laughs> Jonas, it's been um, so great for us to be able to welcome you to the festival. Thank you for sharing the film with us. Thank you for being here. Thank you for flying in to be here for a few days, despite life happening, wishing you the best as life continues. Thank you.